Hello everyone, I'm Chen Vinay Goswami. In this chapter, we will take a look at the overview of the rendering pipeline. This is a good place to put together a bigger picture of the smaller components that we understood in the previous chapters. In this chapter, we will also understand several terms that you will use in the day-to-day -day shader development workflows. We will understand the terms like draw call, Z culling, Z buffer, front facing, back facing, stencil pass, color masking, command buffer, depth testing, Z buffer, color buffer, and frame buffer, etc. So let's begin with the rendering pipeline. An overview of the rendering pipeline can be understood on the basis of the life cycle of a mesh. When we have an app or the game running, it requests to load a mesh and then it requests to render it. When Unity or an application requests to load the mesh, it loads the mesh from the disk onto the RAM. So initially the file existed in the form of .obj or any other format or an FBX format. And once it's loaded in the RAM, it's in the form of the information or the mesh information. Suppose we have a pyramid to draw, then it will be loaded into the RAM. Or if we have a cube to draw, it will be loaded onto the RAM. And then begins the interaction between the CPU and GPU. It's your central processing unit. And this is your graphics processing unit. CPU doesn't directly talk to the GPU, but the communication is done using a queue called as command buffer. It is also called as ring buffer or the ring. And then there is another RAM for the GPU, which is called as VRAM, which stands for video RAM. When CPU requests GPU, to draw something, this request is made in two steps. First step is setting the render state. And second step is drawing the mesh. What we mean by render state, it's a state or the environment in which the mesh will be drawn. So the render state contains the vertex function or the vertex shader. It contains the pixel shader. It contains the texture that will be used to texture the mesh. And then there is a lighting environment, which lighting settings it will be rendered in. So once we have set the state to render an object, we can execute the command to draw the mesh. During this state, the information of the texture and the mesh is transferred over to the VRAM as video RAM is a RAM for GPU and GPU can access VRAM a lot faster than your systems RAM that's why the information is transferred over to the VRAM and that's where the GPU accesses the information once we have set the render state we can start drawing all the meshes that use the same state to render for example, if this cube here is using the same vertex pixel shaders, materials and the textures and the same lighting settings, it will be drawn without setting the render states again because it's using the same render state that is being used to draw this pyramid and then this cube will be drawn. And once another mesh that uses the different render state comes in, the render state is set again and then that particular mesh will be rendered. So setting the state is a lot heavier operation than the draw call and that is why batching occurs. 
and an example for that is unity connects all the objects that use the same shader same material same textures and certain other rendering situations and batch them together so that the render state is set once and then we can keep drawing the objects and the operation of drawing the meshes is called as draw calls so we understood the term draw call and the render state so far I will take you to the unity to show you the rendering stats that we see in the interface so for example here I'm creating three primitives first I create a cube and then I duplicate it so that I use the same render state to draw this cube that means it's using same shader same material and the same texture so if I turn on the stats here we see a term called as batches here and then the saved by batching so batches is what render state changes for rendering these three cubes which use the same material and same texture unity batch them and set the render state once and start drawing those cubes one by one and that is why we see one batching here for three different objects and saved by batching means we did not set the state again for the next two cubes because they use the same render state and one plus two that means there are three draw calls and one render state change that is what you see in the unity stats and that's what these terms mean for the rendering pipeline so once we are done with this process the actual execution begins so now we have the mesh to be drawn first the execution of the vertex shader will begin and we understood that vertex shader reads the attributes from the mesh for example the word position normals tangents etc and as we understood in the previous chapters that once we have the object space attributes we convert them into the world space which is converted into view space and finally to the projection space when we have the projection space matrix that means this matrix is based on frustum of the camera and once this information is ready it is ready to be sent to the rasterizer but before this is sent to the rasterizer an optional step happens which is called as culling culling is a step where front faces and back faces are differentiated they are differentiated by the order of the vertices drawn to draw a triangle you have three vertices if this information is collected in a clockwise manner that means it's a front face and if it is collected in an anti-clockwise order then it is a back face and in this step we can ignore the information of either front faces or the back faces or we can ignore this step as well but by default the back faces are ignored so we render only the front faces of the mesh after that the rasterization process comes in what rasterizer does based on normalized screen space rasterizer determines that which pixels will be drawn for drawing the mesh on the screen i am drawing this mesh off the screen to show that these meshes have been clipped when we converted the information to the projection space so because this portion of the mesh will be out of screen that's why this will be ignored and rasterizer will find that which pixels will be drawn and as we understood in the previous chapter that it also interpolates the information coming from the vertex shader before sending it to the pixel shader so once the pixels or the pixel location has been determined the fragment shader is executed fragment shader or the pixel shader 
I'm trying to pack everything or all the keywords within the same chart so that we have the reference of full rendering pipeline in one slide. And we can take a look at that again to remember which steps belong where in this complete workflow. So when fragment shader is executed, the output of the fragment shader is the color of the 2B pixel because it might have an impact of the final color of the pixel. So one thing that we will get out of the fragment shader is the color of the pixel and then the alpha of the pixel. And the third thing that we also receive in this step is the Z depth of the pixel. In the previous chapter, we also understood that in order to render the objects properly in the scene, a depth test is done, which is called as Z depth testing in which the distance of the pixel from the camera is determined. And based on the distance, our renderer determines that which pixel will be drawn or which pixel will be ignored because it's in the back. For example, this tree comes in front of the hut because the Z distance of the pixels of the tree is lesser than the Z distance of the pixels of the hut. After the fragment shader, a Z test will be done. The result of the Z test is either the pass or the fail. And what happens next after the Z test pass or the fail, we will take a look at that. But before that, we want to see that this is the screen where we want to output or display all the objects that we render and the screen is divided into pixels and for every pixel of the screen there are at least two buffers that are maintained for example the screen has 1 to 10 columns and 10 rows that means it has 10 by 10 equals to 100 pixels on the screen so there will be two buffers that will be of size 100 that will run from 0 to 99 and one buffer will be called as color buffer another buffer will be called as z buffer color buffer is also called as frame buffer so we understood two more terms here, color buffer, frame buffer, and Z buffer, and the Z test that we understood in the previous step. For every pixel of the screen, for the output or the final color of every pixel of the screen, there is a color buffer. Similarly, for every pixel of the screen, there is a Z depth stored in the Z buffer, which we calculate as a result of Z test. So these are the final color value and the Z value for that particular pixel to be drawn on the screen. So if the Z test passes the test for a pixel, after that blending happens. Blending is also an optional step and that is done for the transparent or the translucent pixels. For example, if a translucent card is coming in front of an opaque object, that's when we want to perform the blending function. And we had a full chapter on the blending where we studied that there are different blending methods. For example, source alpha and one minus source alpha, source color, one minus source color. So that is the step that happens after the Z test and it's an optional step that is done for the translucent and the transparent pixels. After the blending, the next step is the stencil test. This is also an optional step which is similar to the Z test and what we do in the stencil test is we set a stencil for the screen. And the stencil is set before drawing any object so that it, we can test that object before drawing against the stencil. 
So for example, for these particular pixels, you set the stencil to 1 and for everything else, the stencil is 0. So when a mesh such as the pyramid will be drawn, only the pixels for which the stencil is set as 1 will be drawn on the screen. So it will look like this on the screen. The stencils are set in the conditions where you want to restrict the area of the render of the scene. For example, you have a whole scene and you are showing that this complete scene is being viewed through the window of a house indoor. And you are standing in front of the window and you are watching this scene and you want to draw the scene that comes in the area of the window. In that case, you will set the stencil in this area of the window and then you will render these all objects. So the final output will be cropped inside this frame. So this process is called as stencil. So after blending, stencil test is done, which is an optional step. You don't have to do it, but if you are doing it, that's where it belongs. So when stencil test passes, the color masking happens. This is also an optional step where you can ignore any channel of the output color. Color mask is the last step where we can separate the color channels output by the fragment shader, which will eventually go to the color buffer. What does that mean is using color mask command, we can separate red, green, blue, and alpha channels. If a fragment shader outputs white color, that means it's outputting R, G, B, and A. To form a white color and to understand the command color mask consider that they are being projected on a screen so normally all the channels will be projected on the screen using color mask what we do is we create a separation using a opaque plate in between the projecting screen and the projector and when we put a slate nothing is being projected on the screen and when we say color mask R, that means we are punching a hole in this slate at the red channel. And what will happen, red color will be projected on the screen, which means the red color will go in the color buffer. In the similar way, when we say color mask R and G, we are punching hole at red channel and green channel. That means red and green both will go to the color buffer and blue and alpha will be rejected and that's how we use color mask for rejecting and separating the color channels we can use a single color channel and we can also use the combination of color channels after the color masking we have the final color of the pixel to be drawn on the screen and that final color goes to the color buffer which is then drawn on the screen during this workflow after the z test if the z test passes z buffer is also written we will take a deeper look into the z test in the next chapter where we will take a look at the example of the rendering and that's when we will know that how exactly the Z test passes and how we write the Z buffer. For now, what you have to remember is that when the Z test passes, the Z test value, which is the distance of that particular pixel from the camera, goes into the Z buffer. For example, if you are rendering this tree and this red pixel on the tree will be rendered on the 75th pixel. So in the Z buffer, in the 75th spot, this Z value will be written. After this final step, we will have the color buffer and the Z buffer for the complete screen and eventually it will be drawn on the screen. 
In this workflow, we saw that the Z test is run after the fragment or the pixel shader. But all the modern GPUs have the capability of running the Z test before the fragment or the pixel shader so that if the Z test fails, we don't have to execute the fragment or the pixel shader. So this was a brief overview of the rendering pipeline concised in less than 20 minutes. So that was it for this chapter. Thank you so much for listening. Bye.